I respect this court, but I'm innocent. I would never, under any circumstances, hurt my wife Maggie, and I would never, under any circumstances, hurt my son Paul Paul. Well, and it might not have been you. It might have been uh, the monster you become when you uh, take 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 opioid pills. Maybe you become another person. Um, I've seen that before. The, you know, the, the person standing before me was not the person who committed the crime, though it's the same individual. Every time a case hits the media whereby a loving husband, father, murders in cold blood his wife or partner and at least one of his children, people ask one question and that question is why? And it's a question so profound that some people just cannot believe that a loving husband could murder his family. They develop theories as to what could have happened. This person couldn't possibly have done it. It must be someone else. It must be someone who hates that family so much that they're prepared to snuff out the lives of multiple people in one family. The latest such case is that of Alec Murdoch. The disgraced ex-attorney was sentenced on the 3rd of March of this year, 2023, to two whole life sentences. Alec Murdoch, who at one time represented clients in the very courtroom of which he was sentenced, will spend the rest of his life behind bars for the murder of his wife, Maggie, and his youngest son, 22-year-old Paul. Alec claims he's innocent. A press conference yesterday by his attorneys slated the investigation and the trial. They'll take it all the way up to the Supreme Court if they have to. Judge Clifton Newman gave a very profound speech to Alec as he was sentenced. He said that he's sure that Maggie and Paul visit him every night. And Alec agreed that yes, they do. And Judge Newman said they will continue to do so. Judge Newman gave Alec an opportunity to speak, to explain his actions. And all Alec could say was, he was innocent. Judge Newman talked about Alec's opioid addiction and said that maybe it wasn't Alec that committed those murders. It was someone else. It was someone else who took over Alec's body that having taken 30, 40, 50, 60 oxycodone pills, he became a monster. Throughout the trial, the prosecution pressed the motive to the jury and to the court that the impending financial disaster that was about to hit Alec's life was the build-up to these murders. And the motive for these murders was that he was about to be found out. His whole family would be in disgrace. I think that's part of the reason why Alec committed these murders. I really do. I think Alec had a very strong sense of entitlement. His family come from a long line of well-respected lawyers. In the very courtroom where Alec was sentenced... Judge Newman said he had to take down a picture of Alec's grandfather so that he could ensure a fair trial. Alec had been stealing from his law firm, from his clients, from his friends for many years. 
And coming up in Alex's near future, Judge Newman is going to preside over 99 charges relating to Alex's financial misdeeds. I think that's part of the reason why Alec murdered Maggie and Paul. The shame that he felt, the disgrace that he knew his family was going to be in once all of these financial crimes came to light. Maybe it drove Alec insane. Maybe, in addition to that, his oxycodone addiction that he couldn't get to grips with, he could not beat, was also a trigger. Paul, amongst the family, was known as the little detective, and he was on at Alec for his drug use. He was on to him. We may never know what triggered the murders at 8.49pm on the 7th of June 2021. We may never know what really was going on in Alec's head. Was it a combination of shame, of severe stress, of addiction, of mental disorder? Probably all of the above. But Alec Murdoch is not the only person who's ever murdered his wife and at least one of his children. He's just the latest in a long line of family murderers. Yes, we have to take each case on a case-by-case basis because these are unusual. These killings are thankfully outside of the norm. Psychological research shows that familicide is different than other types of homicide. Familicide is when someone kills multiple family members. Comparable types of murder include filicide, where a parent murders a child, or uxoricide, which is intimate partner homicide, domestic homicide. A study that was conducted in 2008 comparing spousal and child homicides by mentally disordered perpetrators made some interesting distinctions. They say in the abstract, in the summary of the research, Familicide, the killing of multiple family members, is believed to constitute an overlap between filicide and uxoricide. Given the extreme nature of multiple family homicides, many researchers point towards psychopathological factors underlying these acts. The psychology at the heart of these killers is maybe unusual, is maybe extreme, and... It's that that we need to explore. Familicide perpetrators are more likely than those who murder one of their children to be male, to be older, to be more educated, and they commit the offence with physical violence. They are also more likely than those who commit intimate partner homicides to be married, less likely to have committed a previous violent offence are more likely to suffer from a personality disorder, are more likely to attempt to take their own life following the murders. Those are just some basic demographical differences between those who murder multiple family members or those that murder just one. But it's this group of individuals, not exclusively, but more likely to be male, to be more likely to have been considered a loving husband or partner, a loving father, somebody who would do anything for his kids, a destroyer of worlds, as the judge said of another familicide perpetrator, Anthony Tote, at his sentencing, a destroyer of worlds. I think that's a perfect way to summarise the actions of someone, a loving husband and father, who goes on to annihilate their entire family. It's not just those that are murdered who are destroyed. It destroys the very fabric of a family. In Alec Murdoch's case, he has a surviving son, his elder son, Buster. I can't begin to imagine the pain that Buster feels. 
As far as we understand it, at this moment in time, he's supporting his father. He doesn't believe his father did it. Probably because it's a thought that is too horrid, too horrific to even contemplate. Not only has Alec destroyed the lives of his wife and his son, but he's also given his surviving son a life of psychological pain. His brothers, his sister, and the wider extended family all have to now pick up the pieces of knowing that a once well-respected attorney turned killer. For what? Why? And it's the why that we struggle with so much. But as I said, Alec Murdoch is not the only loving husband and father who, once their life starts to unravel, goes on to commit the ultimate sin. Alec is just the latest in a long line of these people. Familicide is thankfully rare. As it's so unusual, as it's just so undeniably horrific, these cases tend to hit the media. They're discussed on social media. The mainstream media follows every single aspect of this case, dissects it using expert panellists. Everybody, whether you're a member of the general public or whether you're a, an attorney, a psychologist, everybody asks the same question, and that is, why? We've seen that there are some demographic differences. Familicide perpetrators more likely to be male, to be older, to be more educated, and to use physical violence, but also mentally disordered. So is that the common thread that runs through family annihilators? What psychopathology is it? Because, of course, we know that mental ill health is very common. Mental ill health on its own cannot explain familicide. Or else it would be way more common than it is. I think psychology, psychological research can tell us some useful things. But at the end of the day... Because this is rare, I think we have to look at familicide on a case-by-case -case basis. One case that's very well known in the media is that of Chris Watts. Chris Watts, who murdered his wife, Shanann, their unborn baby, Nico, and his daughters, four-year-old Bella and three-year-old Celeste, murdered them all in cold blood. Nobody saw this coming. Chris was mild-mannered. He tended to prefer life in the shadows. His wife, Shanann, was bubbly, sociable, a go-getter, very ambitious. And she perhaps wore the trousers in the household. Is that the reason why Chris murdered her and their children? Was he pushed to the edge by an overbearing wife? An edge that he horrifically stepped over? on the morning of August the 13th, 2018. Some people say so. Some people blame Shanann for what happened to her and her children. But that's not the whole story, is it? There are many people, many, many thousands, even millions of people who live in marriages where one partner wears the trousers and the other is just a natural follower. It seemed that Chris was content enough with his life until a young woman at his workplace showed interest in him and they began an affair. So I'm going to read to you the words that District Attorney Michael Rourke spoke at Chris's sentencing hearing. It describes what happened in the early hours of August the 13th. It doesn't tell us why Chris did what he did. Michael Rourke asked that very question. Why? Why did he do it? He did it, according to Michael Rourke, because he wanted a new life. Why didn't he just get a divorce? Said Rourke. Why didn't he just get a divorce? If you're unhappy in your marriage, you leave. But Chris didn't leave. Chris took an extreme way out. Just two days after this, he confessed 
and was arrested. Didn't contest his charges. Unlike Alec Murdoch, he's come clean. He's spoken about why he did what he did. So I'm going to read you the words of Michael Rourke and then I'm going to read you some of Chris's words. This is uh, DA Michael Rourke. Over the weekend leading up to August 13th, she, Shanann, had been at a work conference in Phoenix, Arizona. The doorbell camera on their home shows her arriving home from the airport. We see her friend, Nicole Atkinson, drop her off and the doorbell camera records her going into the house at 1.48, going into the house to meet her killer. The defendant said they had what he referred to as an emotional conversation about the state of their marriage and about what their lives would look like going forward. And what was said during that emotional conversation, only he knows. What we do know is that shortly after, that the defendant strangled her to death with his own hands. We know that he slowly took her life the morning of August 13th. We know that this was not done in an uncontrolled, vengeful manner. He tried to describe to agents from the CBI and the FBI. If that were the case, you would expect to see vicious, horrible bruising about her neck, shoulders and face. You would expect to see the high eye bone in her neck broken. You would expect to see some kind of defensive wounds on his body as she struggled and fought for her own life. None of those are present. The only injuries that were on Shanann's body, one set of finger or bruising what appeared to be fingernail or finger marks to the side of her neck. We know that our experts tell us that it takes two to four minutes to strangle someone to death manually with their own hands. The horror that she felt as the man she loved wrapped his hands around her throat and choked the life out of her must have been unimaginable. Even worse, what must Bella, age four, and Celeste, age three, have experienced? The one man on this planet who was supposed to nurture and protect them was snuffing out their lives. They both died from smothering. Let me say that again. The man seated to my right smothered his daughters. Why? Well, Chris attempted to explain the why to Special Agent Graham Corder from the FBI, Agent Tammy Lee from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, and Detective Dave Baumhover. In February 2019, when they went to see him at the correctional facility where he's housed in Wisconsin, and he described that he was in some kind of rage, in some kind of daze, he doesn't understand why he did what he did. He also tried to describe what he did to author Sherilyn Cadle in a series of letters. What he told law enforcement officials in February 2019 is slightly different than what he told Sherilyn Cadle. Chris seems to manufacture his own truth. Is that because he doesn't remember? He was in a daze, in another world. Is it comparable to how Judge Newman described how Alec Murdoch becomes a different person? That the person who committed the murders is not the person in front of him now. It's the monster you become that committed those murders. Is it a type of dissociation? Let's read what Chris said about the murders. I really felt like I was under the influence, not of a drug, but of something so evil that it changed me. Let's rewind a bit. Growing up, I was the shyest and quietest person you'd ever meet. I kept to myself. I absorbed my surroundings and adapted to the world around me. I followed the top trends and tried to fit in. I was never my own person. But does that explain why he had to take the lives of his children, Bella Four and Celeste, aged only three. Michael Rourke said of Bella at Chris's sentencing hearing, imagine the horror in Bella's mind as her father took her last breaths away. 
your honour, understand very clearly. Bella fought back for her life. The frenulum, that connective tissue between her upper lip and her gum, had a centimetre and a half laceration. She bit her tongue multiple times before she died. She fought back for her life as her father smothered her. The defendant then methodically and calmly loaded their bodies into his work truck. Not in a hasty or disorganised way. He was seen from the neighbour's doorbell camera back in his truck, into the driveway, going back and forth into the house and back out to the truck three different times, one time for each of their bodies. He then drove them away from their family home one final time. But we learn after this that Bella and Cece were actually alive, that they actually were able to walk out of their home and get into their daddy's work truck. And he took them there to his workplace, Survey 319. He smothered them there at the work site in his truck. And then he put their little lifeless bodies, still warm, into two oil tankers. A different child in each tank. He separated them all in death. Why? Why did he do that? He buried his wife, Shanann, in a shallow grave. She gave birth to Nico in that grave. But why did Chris not put Bella and Cece in the grave with their mother? Did he not have time to dig a big enough hole? Well, Bella and Cece were tiny. One might argue he absolutely did have that time. Was he so angry with Shanann? This rage, this monster that he became took over. And he was so angry that he didn't think Shanann deserved to have her daughters with her, even in death. Perhaps we'll never know the answer to that. Agent Tammy Lee said to Chris when she visited him in February 2019, Chris, we see those videos and that love you had for your girls. Like, it's obvious to us. It's hard for us to understand how a dad who's given piggyback rides and, you know, making snacks and watching princess movies and those kind of things. How do you get to that point? And he said, like I said, it was just something else that was controlling me that day. Something they had no control over. But this wasn't just a split second reaction, was it? Because Chris had to strangle his wife, get her body out downstairs into the truck, take his two daughters 45 minutes to an hour away, smother them and then dispose of their bodies. At any point during those killings, he could have stopped. He could have saved their lives, but he chose not to. And this is a recurrent story in Familicide, that it seems that these killings are planned. Whether the killer is completely in control of that whole planning process is debatable. There's one case, though, from 1971, where the planning of these murders was so meticulous it's difficult to believe that a monster took over that person's psyche. That's the case of John List. John List, who was a meticulous accountant who worked his way up, up a, a banking firm, and then he lost his job. But he couldn't bear the shame of telling his family that he'd lost his job. So every single day, he went out as if he was going to work. But he didn't. He would go and sit on a train station or in the park or somewhere and then come home at night as if he'd done a day's work. His financial burden overtook him. He couldn't live any longer. You know, stealing money from his mother tidied him over for a while. But at the point, he could no longer hide the truth of his financial ruin from his family. What did he do? He planned their murders. He murdered his elderly mother, who lived with them. He shot his wife. He shot his 16-year-old daughter. And he shot his two sons. And then he left their bodies in the house 
he calmly walked away from his life, leaving the lights on and music playing so that neighbours would think that that house was occupied. He sent notes to the children's schools telling them that they had to go away to care for an ailing relative. And he went and he started his new life. He married again and he lived a very unremarkable life for 18 years. It was only when the show America's Most Wanted featured John List's case. An artist had made a bust out of clay, an age progression that was so uncannily like John that a neighbour from where he'd lived in Colorado recognised him. And it took two weeks for law enforcement to piece it all together and arrest John List 18 years after the meticulous murder of his family. The case of Anthony Tote reminds me a lot of John List. It also reminds me of Alec Murdoch and to a lesser extent, Chris Watts. Chris Watts knew that if he got a divorce, he would never be free of his financial burdens, that he blamed Shanann for. Shanann was a big spender. Chris tried to be careful with money, but Shanann would spend it. She would earn it. She was ambitious, but she wanted a lavish lifestyle. Chris knew that if he left Shanann shacked up with Nicole Kessinger, he would never be free of that financial burden. Is it really the case that these men murdered their wives and their children because of money, because of their financial doom? Is it a little bit deeper than money, though? The underlying construct that I see, not so much in Chris's case, but certainly in Alex's case, the case of John List and the case of Anthony Tote were that these men were used to being successful. These men had worked hard for their position and their prestige in their local communities. Facing financial ruin was so much of a shame that they perhaps didn't want their families to see them in that way. I describe it as a silent snap. I describe it as somebody whose walls close in around them. And then, for whatever reason, on one particular day, they snap. A silent snap. A snap that's actually quite protracted. John List was able to meticulously plan these murders. We could argue that Alec Murdoch planned the murders. Anthony Tote told about three or four different stories. But he planned those murders. He knew his family was going to die at his hands. At any point, he could have stopped it. But instead of facing that financial ruin and facing their family and, you know, admit that they were going to have to tighten their belts and lead a very different life. Instead of admitting that, they go and murder their family as the, as the what, as the easy way out. Psychological research would tell us that that psychopathology is so disordered. It's probably a delicate interplay between a whole range of factors. But psychology cannot definitively pin down why some people face financial ruin, admit to their families that what they've done is wrong and their families help them pick up the pieces. Or maybe the family breaks down and they get a divorce and they live a much more humble life moving forward than they've been used to. But nobody dies, nobody's murdered. There's no intention of that. Mental ill health is prevalent in society, but only a small minority of people are led by that disorder to murder their families. Psychology cannot pin down why these loving fathers, these loving husbands, take their lives of the people who love them the most in the world. There's no warning in these cases. 
there's no warning because these are loving husbands and loving fathers. People are so shocked by what they've done that they just can't believe it. They can't believe it. But yet there it is. In these cases, what is the most alarming thing to me is that we can't predict who is going to morph that stress and that burden and dissociate so badly that they go on to become a monster, that they stand in front of their families for one last time and that monster takes over. We can't predict that and that, my friends, is scary.